from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all of the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And in this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And there is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that we should grumble, that, that you should grumble against us? Moses also said. You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of my children. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread. As your Bibles might say, the manna. The Lord has given you to eat. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I know what I say in the next few minutes is actually going to go out on YouTube, but I have to say it anyway. Uh, good news, guys. We got through uh, most of that very uh, complicated stuff. Now I need you to uh, queue up that video and have it ready. I'll tell you when, when we need it. This passage has always struck me. And I believe it's because I am a grumbler. I didn't notice it. People pointed it out to me that I can complain about things that are little bitty things. What about you, grumbling? I, uh, I grumble to this day about that ugly Dodge Dart that I went to college with and how difficult it was with as many pimples on my face to get a girlfriend to get in that car. There were Porsches out there. There were Corvettes. My roommate had a black lacquered Corvette. He parked it right beside my Dodge. I didn't have a chance in a thunderstorm, you know, and I grumbled about my ugly car. And I was so very slow to be thankful that I had an ugly car. <laughs> finally got me a pickup truck with a Hemi. I'm 60 years old. I finally have a Hemi. And there's a V6 out in the parking lot with dual turbos. That'll still take me out. And Butch has told me all about it. He can take me anytime he wants to. But I'm so proud to finally have a vehicle with some oomph to it. Because that Corolla could barely get out of the way of itself. <laughs> and if it did get up to speed, there was a flap of paint on top that would, that would kind of, this is not a political comment, but it would kind of lay up like Donald Trump's hair in the breeze, and then when you come to a stop, it'd lay back down. And it was embarrassing to go anywhere with this car with, with, the, with the toupee, you know, kind of thing. And I knew somebody loved me. If they go out on a date in that car with me, there were one or two nearsighted people who did. After Joseph had been sold into slavery, it's a long story, Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers because they were, 
they were jealous of him. And Joseph ends up in Egypt because of, a, of, a, of, of a, an ability he has to understand dreams. Uh, Joseph kind of rose to power. He becomes number two in Egypt. Then the famine hits and all of his brothers came and eventually his dad came. You remember that story. I preached from it a few weeks ago. And in that story, Joseph basically let his brothers off the hook. You, you didn't sell me into slavery. God brought me here so that I could rescue you. That's a very, that, that's a lot more generous than my brother is to me or I've ever been to my brother. And you know what, what happened after that? The, the Israelites stayed in Egypt and everything they did turned to gold. Kind of like it might do even to this day, you know. They're just very good in business. And in Egypt, the Jewish people multiplied, so there were more and more of them, and they went into businesses, and they did real well. And there came a point in time when the Pharaoh who let them stay had died that the new Pharaoh that followed him woke up one day and said, Wait a minute. I think we've been invaded by very good merchants. There's a whole bunch of them. They own a lot of our country. This is getting out of hand here. And so he reduced all of the children of Israel to slaves. And for hundreds of years, they served to Egypt because they had to. They're alive because of Egypt, but they're also slaves because of Egypt. And they began to cry out to God, help us, help us, help us. We're slaves. We're your people. You're our God. Why are we slaves? We belong to you. We're special. <laughs> they still want preferential treatment to this day. God help them. Because they're God's people. But they're slaves. And they cried out for somebody to rescue them. And it happened in a very odd way, didn't it? Moses. The little baby that was almost slaughtered. In this story, he gets rescued, and next thing you know, because God is so much smarter than the rest of us, Moses ends up in the king's palace, friends with the king, and being raised by a princess and her servants and this and that. And one day God calls Moses to go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. I told you a few weeks ago, Moses had a speech impediment. He didn't really feel comfortable doing anything of that sort. But then if he'd been the most eloquent speaker in the world, he'd have been in, in, uh, intimidated by going to Pharaoh and saying, give up your slaves. Just give up all of that free labor and let us leave. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The Bible says God hardened his heart so that he could show his power on several different levels. Moses won their freedom after Israel had witnessed in Egypt 10 plagues that fell on Egypt. You remember? This, this morning I was thinking, what are those seven plagues again? So I looked it up. There's 10 of them, by the way. Let me tell you all of them. The water turned into blood. That didn't impress Pharaoh. Suddenly there were frogs everywhere, but that doesn't necessarily mean God's around. Then there were lice everywhere. Then there were flies everywhere. Then all of the livestock got sick. Then all of the... Uh, Egyptians had boils. Now, the Israelites didn't have boils, and they didn't have frogs everywhere, and th their livestock wasn't dying. But the Egyptians, it was getting worse and worse and worse, boils. If you've ever had one, you don't want another one. And if you've never had one, you're luckier than I am. And after the boils were gone, hail that destroyed the crops and left it just laying in the field. Well, it can't get any worse than that, can it? Oh, yes, it can. Then God brought locusts to eat whatever had fallen on the ground. So once the crop was destroyed, lying on the ground, it's not going to grow anymore. This is all we're going to get. Then the locusts ate that, and suddenly they're hungry. Moses kept saying, let my people go. God wants his people to be free. Nope, not going to do it. Three days of darkness followed. And Pharaoh still said, look, I'm the boss around here. These people work for me. They are second-class citizens. We need them. So the tenth and final plague, every firstborn male child in Egypt died in one night. Not the Israelites, 
Because God had told them about a Passover. They're to kill a lamb and they're to cook it a certain way and the blood is to be painted across their doorposts and when the spirit of death comes through, they, he will see the blood on the doorpost and know this is a faithful Jew. He's not only a Jewish person, but he's someone who did what God said. So they passed over the Israelites, but every firstborn child in Egypt died in one night, including Pharaoh's heir. That was enough. Get out of my sight. I don't want to see you. Get! Take your silver, take your gold, take your livestock. Leave our country and don't come back. So 600 men plus women and all the children, there's no telling how many slaves were set free that morning. 600,000 men plus their wives and all their children were given the opportunity to leave. So they left and then Pharaoh changed his mind just as they got headed toward the Red Sea. You remember the story of the Red Sea? The children of Israel once again moaned, here we are out in the desert, we don't have anything to eat and the army's coming at us and the, and the, and, and the sea's right here, what are we gonna do? Well, you know, there've been a lot of people trying to make sense of the Red Sea. Some people say it's the Reed Sea that dries up certain times every year, but you really can't, you really can't drown a bunch of Egyptian soldiers in chariots in a foot deep of water, so that doesn't make any sense. The Bible says it was the Red Sea, which is very, very deep. And the children of Israel were backed up against this wall of water behind them and the, Egyptian, or, or the, the water in front of them and the Egyptian army coming hard in front of them. And they saw on one day the waters part to the point where the scriptures say they went across the Red Sea on dry land. It wasn't even muddy. What was that like? How did God do that? I don't have a clue. But don't miss heaven. These are the kind of things you'll want to ask him when you get the ability to speak. When the, when the frog in your throat clears and you're finally able to say something, you might want to ask him how he pulled off the Red Sea. Moses held up his staff and the waters parted and they went across on dry land. They got to the other side and they're still complaining. The Egyptians are going to do what we just did. We're still doomed. Moses, we're still doomed. We should have stayed slaves. We were so happy making bricks for those people. They were nice to us. They fed us gruel and dirty water. And here we are out here. You're trying to kill us. Moses dropped the staff. The Egyptian army was down, not in that little shallow reed sea, but the waters came in and drowned them. And off they went toward the promised land. Finally learned their lesson, right? No. <laughs> they had seen the plagues. They had they cried out for a leader. God raised up a leader just like they asked for and put him in the, in the, in the temple, in the palace. The plagues had come. They had been set free. Who would have thought that could happen? Their prayer was answered. They get backed up against the Red Sea and then that miracle happened. They go through, the army is destroyed, they're out in the desert, they're on their way. Were they happy? No, they grumbled. There was no food or water, and they turned on Moses and Aaron. In the desert, there was no food or water. The whole congregation, 600,000 men, plus whatever wives they had, plus all the children they had been making, they did not have cable television. There were children in this huge army complaining against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness in order to kill this whole assembly with hunger. That's verses 2 and 3. Do you see yourself in this story? Un unable to see your blessings? because you just focus on the problem instead of the solution. I look back on my college days and realize how impossible it was I was even there. Barely got out of high school, I didn't care. I went to college because I didn't know what else to do. The draft was over, I didn't have to, but 
College would probably be a good idea, but I didn't have the money to go. I didn't have a car to get me there. I had a friend with a Volkswagen. I leaned on him for a year till I got, you know, that babe magnet of a car. I shouldn't have been there at all. I lived on $5 worth of food a day. Don't try that anymore. That's back when my dad was raising us on $13,000 a year, I suspect. But if I had uh, milk and cereal for breakfast, that was about a dollar, so I could have a $2 lunch. And if I got water instead of getting a drink, I might be able to get a drink at night. And I lived on $5 a day. And I thought I was being treated so harshly by life. That, bu that buddy of mine with the Corvette, his dad gave him $150 a week to come back if that's not enough. You know, we were living under the same roof. He would bring home scallops and butter and saute him up. And I'd be eating beanie weenies in the can, smelling <laughs> this wonderful seafood. And I felt like I was so mistreated. I look back and I realize I shouldn't have been able to have gotten to college at all. I shouldn't have been able to have gotten in. I don't, know, I don't know where the line is. You're too stupid to come to Western Kentucky University. Somehow I got above that line. Somehow. They allowed me to even try. Five years in the summer, I got my four-year degree. It was hard. It was difficult. It was painful. But it was also impossible, and God pulled it off. And I didn't have an idea until my last year of college what I was going to do with my life. I couldn't see God's hand of provision because I didn't have as much stuff as my friends. The guy with the Corvette, he also had a TV. I didn't have one of those forever. And when I finally got one, it was black and white, this big. I felt so mistreated that instead of watching TV, I studied. Lord knows I needed more study than Mark did. So Mark got the TV, and I got to study extra. I couldn't see my blessings because I focused on the negative instead of the positive. After all these miracles... Israel was blind to all their blessings. They had seen miracles. They had survived. They were eating in the desert. Moses found water where there just didn't seem to be any water at all. Now, there, there's a miracle in that, and there's, a, there's a, um, a scientific explanation for that. When it rains, it goes into these the, uh, the, the hills, the mountains that are there, and it gets stuck in the rocks. And as it starts pouring out through the cracks in the bottom, the sediment from above clogs that thing up, and then the winds dry it off. And so it looks like rock, but it's really kind of a plug. There's a scientific reason why there was water in that rock in the middle of the desert. That still doesn't explain how Moses found the plug. He knew where to tap the rock with a a staff, so there'd be enough water for 600,000 men plus whatever wives there happened to be and all those children. That's still quite a trick. And they weren't satisfied to eat and drink and be free. And being a slave looked good to them. So God provided water and manna quail every day and this manna stuff which NIV says is bread it's a flower kind of thing it was just everywhere every morning and you collect that stuff and for some strange reason it cooks up just like bread so they ate better in the desert than they did as slaves and of course they did they're free and God's leading them so now they're happy right no now they're happy because we're sick and tired of quail and bread. Are, are you in this story anywhere? Because I'm right in the middle of it. I wanted to be a, an athlete, and I was just a trumpet player. So instead of thanking God for giving me musical ability, I grumbled and complained because I couldn't beat people up like Kirk could. <laughs> Kirk became a Christian later on. I realize we're on the same team now. But for a while, I couldn't see my blessings because my attitude was wrong. God's people fed, watered, free, 
in the wilderness on their way to the promised land, a miracle leader they had prayed for and received, 10 miracles and plagues. They just couldn't see anything to be happy about. They couldn't see God's hand in their life. What about you? I have a little something that I found this week, and it's out there on the Internet so much you've probably seen it. If you haven't, uh, get up some tissue. And if you have, it's good enough to watch three or four times. Are you ready? This is a video of a man about my age who's been colorblind all of his life as he receives a special birthday gift. Happy birthday, dear daddy. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> How old are you now? <laughs> oh, there's, there's something for you to open. I'm younger than you. Shush up. <laughs> but I moved like a brother to a sister. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's moving it. He's posing. I'm what? He thinks he knows what it is. If I was going to guess. Don't guess. You're going to guess wrong. You're going to guess wrong. Really? Yeah. I think the other, I don't know, there's only, I think the other end is easier to open. Scotch tape. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, packing tape. Yeah. Sorry. Maximize that if you can. We'll get it. You're just slow because of your age. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could probably still outrun you. <laughs> I don't know, not with that knee. I got all replacement parts. <laughs> <laughs> all right, one more time. How many of you have done this? <laughs> Are you saving the paper? Birthday baby from all of us. Happy birthday. What is this? Put them on. Put them on. Put them on. The sunglasses. Now watch carefully. How does it look? Oh, that's weird. Look at the balloons. <laughs> Can you see with our eyes now, baby? Can you, what colors you see? Those. You see colors now? Oh, the trees are neat. <laughs> 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 now you have rose-colored glasses, baby. <laughs> Now you see with our eyes. Do you like the balloons? No. Uh, oh. These glasses have taken away his color blindness. He's seen color for the first time. Turn around. What about the flowers in the house?
<laughs> oh my goodness. It doesn't look like mud. <laughs> it looks like brighter mud. Forever. The trees look so. They don't even look real. <laughs> Seriously, they look 3D. That one's changing colors up there. Oh, yeah. and then orange. You see that? Oh, man. Oh. Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> it is like the Wizard of Oz, isn't oh, it? Man. It's definitely like the Wizard of Oz when you go black and white and all of a sudden oh, you see brown. color. You're not in Kansas anymore, yeah, baby. No, and you, and you know what? 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 I did. But it's all zero. And what color is Floppy's house? <laughs> it's like, like the yellow. Green. What the hell? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. It's a green. Now we got to go back. But this didn't... Oh. Oh, it's... <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, you get it? When I was a little boy, there was this girl with long hair that was in my class. And everybody knew she was, she was probably just stupid. She didn't do well in school. She didn't answer the questions right. She wasn't very attractive. She was very poor. Her and her brothers and sisters all looked exactly the same. Something was wrong in that family. But I went back to Scottsville to be a pastor and she started worshiping with our church and when the church wasn't all that warm to her, that's when I developed a very close relationship with her. And I realized the reason she can't talk plain is because she hasn't heard anything since she was four. And the reason she hasn't heard anything since she's four is because she got sick and they put something in her ears and she lost her hearing. She hasn't heard anything and she's bright and she has a sense of humor, but you have to learn that tongue so you can communicate with her and so we found some money and we got her hearing aids and a few of us went to Bowling Green to pick up those hearing aids and she put them in her ear and she had a look on her face much much like that fella and so we had planned on taking her to her favorite place whatever that was she says any place that's got beef all right so we headed to the nicest steakhouse and we were going across town in Bowling Green and she said, did you know when you go across a bridge, the road sounds different? And I said, well, of course. She says, I didn't. And she's sitting in the back and I'm looking in the rear view mirror and she's just hearing things she hasn't heard since she was four years old. And my buddy, the, the atheist, he was in the front seat because he was a part of this, that part of this ministry. <laughs> I looked at the back seat and I said, you are grinning like it's Christmas. Ha, 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 And she says, but it is Christmas. I saw this video and I was convicted. He was so excited because he can see colors. And I've seen colors all of my life, but I've not said thank you for that. I don't have as much as some, but I have a lot more than I deserve, and I don't say thank you for that. And then it hit me. He's not blind. I am. He saw in black and white, and now he sees in color. And I look at a life that has been blessed of God, called we preachers will say, God called seminary trained bishop sent and grumble and complain about our life. What do you see when you look around? Do you see colors? Well, he didn't for 50 something years. Say thanks. 
Have you been fed in difficult times? Have you been scared out of your mind that you weren't going to make it? But you did. Be thankful to God. Have you survived tragedies and calamity? I now have friends in Puerto Rico. I'm now worried about Puerto Rico. I see videos of Puerto Rico this week and I start crying. I don't know whether those people I met at the funeral a few months ago are alive or not. And then the word finally came out. Somebody had pulled at a public library and found a Wi-Fi signal and was able to tell New York, we're all well. We won't have electricity for six months and we're drinking whatever we can find, but we're all healthy. The storm didn't take one of us. Have you survived tragedy and calamity? Do you see God's hand moving in your life? Can you see in this child a faith that is stronger than most of ours? And the courage to quote scripture when she had no warning I was going to ask her to do that. the way God is blessing our bus ministry and those who are running it. Can you see what God is doing around you? Miracles, blessings, acts of love because you are precious to Him. Are you grateful for God's good gifts? Or have you grown blind? to what God has been doing for you. What can you see? I think as this service kind of comes to an end, we all just need to stop and take a look at our lives a little different and realize God's doing some wonderful things in and around us that has nothing to do with how wonderful we are and everything to do with how wonderful he is. We don't deserve it. He's just that good. He's just that good. A hurricane as big as Texas went over the top of Puerto Rico and everybody I've ever met from there is still breathing this morning. God is so good. Lord, forgive me, for I have been blind to what you have been doing in our lives. Help me to see and to be glad. Teach me not to grumble and complain, for all your gifts are good. And all the people said,